One of the most powerful aspects of computer programming is the ability to instruct a computer to repeat some set of actions until a condition is met. This is called looping, and in this episode, I'm going to show you how to program with loops on the 6502. Loops are a very general concept in computer programming, and when combined with branching, they're extremely powerful. This can sometimes be a little hard for beginners to understand, since the concept of repeating things over and over again seems pretty simple. But trust me, at a very deep level, it's loops that separate interesting computer programs like games from just simple recipes. In this video, I'll explain what loops are, how they work, and how to use them in 6502 assembly. With the foundations in place, I'll then work through a concrete example and show you how loops can be used when programming games. Many of the real-world tasks that we perform on a daily basis involve loops, though you probably don't tend to think about them in such a formal way. Things like washing dishes, counting money, or doing laundry all involve repeating some set of tasks until a condition is met. In a very real sense, tasks such as these can be modeled as algorithms involving loops, and because of this, most folks already have an intuitive understanding of the basic concept here. Let's drive the point home by taking a look at one specific task, dealing a hand of cards. Okay, so say four friends sit down for a game of five card stud poker. For ease of explanation, I'll label the friends A through D and assume that player A is currently acting as the dealer. The goal is to analyze the steps involved and make an algorithm that models the act of dealing the cards. According to the rules that I know, each player can only be dealt a single card at a time, and the first one to receive a card is the person to the dealer's left, in this case, player B. The next card goes to the person at player B's left, and so on until each of the players has been dealt five cards. Watching the process in motion should give you a feel for the underlying loop. Starting with player B, the dealer works around the table, over and over again in a circle, dealing a single card at a time. With each round, the number of cards dealt to the players increases by one until finally, each player has five cards. Looking at it formally, the process that's being looped or repeated here is that of dealing a single card to each player. Every time the dealer makes a full loop, they then check the number of cards in their hand. If the count is five, then the dealing is done. Otherwise, the process repeats. In technical terms, the act of dealing a single card to each player is called the body of the loop. The body handles the actions that need to be repeated for the algorithm, whether it's dealing cards or modifying some data in a computer's RAM. The last bit, where the dealer counts the number of cards in their hand, that's called the condition. Its job is to determine if the loop should continue by answering some yes or no question. In this example, have all players been dealt five cards? There are a lot of programming languages, and most languages have multiple ways to define loops. But no matter the language or the approach, loops always consist of two things, a body of instructions to be repeated and some condition that determines if the loop should continue. Okay, so that's a pretty good conceptual definition for a loop, but what do they actually look like in assembly? There's a couple of ways to write loops in 6502, but they all boil down to the same basic approach. The first thing you're going to need is a set of instructions for the body of the loop. Again, this is the business logic that needs to be repeated in order to carry out whatever operation you're trying to accomplish. Next, a label is required, specifically pointing to the first instruction of the body. The label gives us an easy-to-use reference pointing to the program ROM address of the body's first instruction, allowing us to jump back there for each iteration of the loop. The final component is the condition, which is usually composed of two steps. First, we need to perform some sort of comparison instruction, such as a CMP. As I covered in the episode on branching, this will toggle some set of processor flags, which can then be used by a branch instruction to control the flow of the program. The idea here is that the comparison will provide us with the answer to the yes or no question, should the loop continue? And depending on the branch instruction used, the program will either jump back to the top of the loop for another iteration, or continue forward with the rest of the program, effectively breaking the loop. Now, this is by no means the only way to structure loop code in 6502 assembly. For instance, in some cases, it may be favorable to have the condition come before the body. This requires that you change up how the loop is structured a bit, but can be really useful if you have game logic that requires you to skip the loop entirely if some condition is met. More advanced examples may have loops nested inside of other loops with complex branching logic. And in some cases, the loop might not even have a condition at all. These are called infinite loops, and pretty much every game on the NES has at least one of them. 
There are many interesting techniques and approaches when it comes to looping, and I could spend a lot of time discussing each and every one of them. But my goal here is to cover the basics and ensure that you know what a loop is and how to use one. So let's save the advanced techniques for future videos and take a look at a concrete game programming example, the JRPG multi-attack. In classic JRPGs like Final Fantasy, attack spells will either target a single enemy or all of the enemies. Generally, I refer to this latter type as a multi-attack since you're performing an attack on multiple enemies at once. One way to implement this would be to have a big run of code that performs the logic for each monster individually. Such an approach will work, but it has a couple of big downsides. One issue is that there's going to be a lot of code, and since ROM space is limited, this could become an issue if you need that room for additional logic or graphics. Further, you'd be repeating the same code over and over again with only minor changes. Now, this isn't too bad in and of itself, but if you happen to make a mistake in only one section of the code, it could be a nightmare to debug. Since we need to perform the same action repeatedly, a much better way to implement the attack is using a loop. And for this example, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So let me set a few constraints. First, I'll assume that the game can have a maximum of eight monsters in battle at once, and that each of the monsters' hit points can fit into a single byte of information. This probably won't be the case for a production game, but multi-byte arithmetic is kinda out of scope here. Second, I'll assume that the attack does a fixed amount of bite-sized damage. Let's say 50 points. Again, this is a little simplistic, as most JRPGs will calculate damage using a random number generator. But there's no way I'll be discussing those in this video. With the constraints set, detailing the program itself is pretty straightforward. First, I'll use a loop to set up a table to hold each of the monster's HP and RAM. Since each monster's HP fits nicely into a single byte, the memory structure is simple, just eight consecutive bytes starting at address 300. Next, the program will use another loop to perform the multi-attack logic. The body of the loop will apply damage to one monster after another, and the condition will break out of the loop once every monster has been hit. Compared to other examples in the series, this one is pretty big, and I'll be introducing a bunch of new instructions and concepts. If you're fuzzy on branching or basic arithmetic using the 6502, I urge you to go back and watch the videos on those topics. Okay, disclaimers out of the way. Let's dive into the code. The first task is to initialize each monster's HP and RAM, and to accomplish this, I use a byte table and a loop. Setting this up is pretty easy. Just combine the label with a special assembler control command called dot byte. This command allows you to place arbitrary bytes of information in the ROM, and is pretty useful for quickly adding game data that needs to be referenced at runtime. To see how this works, let's step through the code for the initialization loop itself. The first thing that the program does is to set the value for the X register to 7. This serves two purposes. First, the program uses it as an index when calculating the byte address for a given monster's HP, and second, it allows the program to keep track of the number of times the loop has been run. On line 9, I place a label to denote the start of the loop's body, which is pretty short and only consists of two instructions. The first instruction loads a value from the initial HP table that I put in the ROM, and the second stores that value into the monster HP table in the system's RAM. This is a pretty common pattern in NES game programming, and is used when doing things like loading levels, setting up battles, etc. Both instructions use what's called absolute indexed addressing. The way this works is you first define a full base address, and then you provide an offset by specifying either the X or the Y register. The example on line 10 uses a base address given by the initial monster HP label and gives the X register for the index. At runtime, the 6502 will calculate the address for the load instruction by simply adding the base address to the value currently held in the X register. After assembly and linking, the label will be given an absolute 16-bit address in the ROM, something like 8070, and for the first iteration of the loop, the X register will contain the value of 7. When load A is executed, the base address of 8070 will be added to the index of 7, resulting in the final address of 8077. Looking at the bytes in the ROM, we see that this corresponds to the eighth monster's initial HP value in the table, so the value of 50 is loaded into the accumulator. The next instruction works in a similar way, but this time I use a base of 0300, which corresponds to the start of the monster HP table in RAM. Again, the 6502 first calculates the final address by adding the base value to the X register, and once the calculation is complete, uses that address to store the value. The next two instructions on lines 12 and 13 handle the condition for the loop. 
First, the program uses the DEX instruction to decrement the value of the X register by one, and then uses a new instruction called BPL, or branch on positive result, to perform the branch for the loop. BPL is a pretty straightforward branching instruction. Basically, it'll only jump to the given label if the processor's negative flag is clear. Otherwise, if the negative flag is set, it'll ignore the branch and the program will continue on to the next instruction. In this case, it's the combination of DEX and BPL that make the loop work. One of the side effects of the decrement X instruction is that if X contains a value of zero, then the value will wrap around to 255 and the processor's negative flag will be set. If this is not the case, then the value will simply be lowered by one and the negative flag will be cleared. For the first iteration of the loop, the X register contains a value of seven. After the DEX instruction runs, this value will be lowered to six and the processor's negative flag will be cleared. With the flag cleared, the BPL instruction will branch to the initialize HP loop label, which rests at the top of the loop's body. This begins another iteration of the loop, but this time the value for the X register is six instead of seven. This means that the computed addresses for both the load and the store will be one less, which is to say the program will now be handling the values for the seventh monster instead of the eighth. The process continues again and again with each iteration of the loop initializing the HP value for the next monster in descending order until it reaches the first monster at index zero. This time, when the DEX instruction is run, the value wraps around and the processor's negative flag is set. This causes BPL to ignore the branch and continue on to the next instruction, breaking out of the loop. With initialization complete, each monster now has the appropriate HP and RAM, and we can move on to the actual multi-attack logic, starting on line 15. As is often the case with loops that operate over a table of data, the first step is to initialize the index. This is exactly what I'm doing on line 15 by loading a zero into the X register. For the initialization loop, I chose to start at the end and work to the beginning, mostly because it was a little cleaner to code it that way. For the multi-attack logic, I'm gonna do the opposite, start from the front and move to the back. This particular loop can be broken down into a few logical steps. First, the HP value for the monster at the current index is loaded into the accumulator, and then the damage is applied by performing a subtraction. Next, the loop checks to see if the operation resulted in a negative number, and if it did, makes sure that the value is capped to a minimum of zero. After this, the loop stores the result back into RAM, and finally, the last three lines perform the logic for the loop's condition. For the first iteration of the loop, x is equal to zero, so the HP value of the first monster is loaded from address 0300 in RAM. The loop then performs a subtraction by using two new instructions, SEC, otherwise known as set carry, and SBC, which stands for subtract with carry. My plan is to dedicate an entire episode of the series to negative numbers and subtraction on the 6502, so I'm not gonna do a deep dive here. For now, just know that when you want to perform a single byte subtraction, you gotta first set the carry flag using SEC. This is exactly what the program does. First, I set the carry using SEC, then I subtract 50 from the accumulator by way of SBC. Because the first monster has 80 hit points, the value in the accumulator will now be 80 minus 50, or 30. In addition to performing the actual subtraction, the SBC command will also manipulate the processor's flags. Of particular interest here is the processor's negative flag, which, as you might expect, is set if the result is negative and cleared if it's zero or above. In this case, the value of 30 is decidedly non-negative, so the instruction clears the flag. The subsequent BPL instruction uses this flag to determine whether or not the HP value needs to be capped at a minimum of zero. Remember, BPL performs the branch to the given label if the negative flag is clear. Speaking of the label, you probably noticed I'm using some funny syntax to the right of BPL. That's called an unnamed label designator, and it's referring to an unnamed label represented by the single colon at the start of line 22. Unnamed labels are exactly what they sound like, they're just labels without a name. To reference them, you use a colon followed by a series of plus and minus signs. A single plus refers to the first label after the current instruction, and a single minus to the first label before the current instruction. Two plus signs denote the second label forward, two minus signs the second label backward, and so on. Now, abusing unnamed labels can result in some extremely messy and hard to read code. Even the CA65 manual notes this. But if you know how they work and keep them simple, I think they can make certain sections of code both easier to write and interpret. I tend to use them in situations just like this, a single branch over a small handful of instructions, all within the context of some self-contained piece of logic. 
<laughs> Some people will hate it, others will love it, but I thought I'd show you how they work so you can make the decision on whether or not you want to use them for yourself. Moving back to the code, at this point, the carry flag will be clear since the subtraction above resulted in a positive number. This will cause the branch to be taken, skipping over line 21 and causing the value to be stored into RAM at the appropriate spot in the table. The next section starts by incrementing the value of x by 1, then comparing it to the immediate value of 8. The CPX or compare with x instruction works in a very similar way to the CMP instruction that I covered in the branching video, but instead of comparing the given result to the accumulator, it compares it to the x register. CPX will set the zero flag if the values are equal, allowing the BNE or branch if not equal instruction to make a decision. BNE will only branch to the given label when the zero flag is clear, and this will only be the case as long as x is not exactly equal to 8. Since x holds a value of 1 at this point, the branch will be taken, jumping the processor back up to the top of the body for another iteration. During the next pass of the loop, the HP value loaded from RAM is less than the amount of damage done by the attack. This means that SBC will toggle the processor's negative flag, causing BPL to skip branching and cap the value appropriately. The loop then continues with each iteration updating subsequent values in RAM according to the logic in the body. After the eighth iteration, CPX finally sets the processor's zero flag, causing the BNE instruction to skip the branch and exit the loop. I was somewhat worried that I might not have enough material for an entire episode by focusing solely on loops, but as you can see, I was wrong about that. Ultimately, I think loops are pretty simple, but that's only if you have a firm understanding of how they're structured and the kind of things that you can do with them. Hopefully, I was able to shed some light on both of those topics, and now you know what a loop is and how to write one in 6502. Thanks for watching Ness Hacker. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Click the bell icon if you want to be notified when I upload new videos to the channel. And if you have any questions or feedback, let me know in the comments.